we have to look at every child and who they are and be careful about labeling, be careful about the medical model and diagnosis because we're really way more complex than that. Welcome to the show where we talk about topics in modern Christianity that are so challenging, they require us to be grounded in something much bigger than ourselves. If you're here, you have likely found yourself hungry for something deeper. You want to find answers for how to hold on to your faith after seeing religion be twisted in a way that has somehow become bad news instead of good. I'm here for all of that too. I'm here for the spiritual wrestle, and I'm here to learn more ways that people are finding hope in a God that interrupts our norms and expectations. I can't thank my team at Kindred Exchange enough for being willing to bring podcasts like this to the world of global missions. We are committed to fostering conversations and facilitating cross-cultural exchanges that empower the global church to serve together. At Kindred Exchange, we believe that missions is and should be considered mutual, where the church in North America is carrying out the mission of God with the same invitation as the church in Zimbabwe, Peru, Myanmar, and Iraq. We are all offering a unique flavor of hospitality to the world, and we are made whole by one another's walk with our Creator. Within our organization, you'll find followers of Christ who love missions enough to see it done differently, and we welcome you into our exploration of the reformation and redemption of the North American mission system. Check us out at kindredexchange.org. When we think about children who have experienced really tragic things early on in life, we know that that impacts their development. And today I am thrilled to introduce you guys to Dr. Patty Venez, who has spent much of her career diving into the depths of developmental trauma, uh, into the depths of how children's bodies protect them specifically through their brain processes. And and does some really incredible work that I, I hate to reveal in the beginning, but it's some of her work has just stopped me in my tracks and, and been such a, a huge breath of fresh air to me as we navigate what it means to love and support kids throughout their lives, especially with their brain growth and their brain development. Uh, Dr. Patty, thank you so much for joining us today from Nashville. Um, I am so grateful for your time and for the years and years of work that you've put into the mental health space. Um, what would you like to share with listeners about your particular background and your credentials? Well, thank you, Lauren. I'm really glad to be here. You have found me in a space of my, in, my incredible passion uh, because this has been my lifelong work. I actually started off as a clinical psychologist looking into more of what we would call um, neuropsychology, which is the assessment and understanding of just the brain in general. And I, I went into developmental neuropsychology, really thinking I was going to uh, look at ADHD and learning disabilities and help families navigate the school systems and that kind of work. And then um, I had a calling and basically God put me down in a place I didn't expect to ever be living, which was Huntsville, Alabama. And I was there due to my husband's work, not due to my own work. It was my first place to work after my internship. And it was where the National Children's Advocacy Center was located, Huntsville, Alabama. I actually lived in Ardmore, Tennessee, across the border. Well, because this amazing center was there, which turns out to be the mothership of the advocacy center movement in the world, because mm -hmm. there are child advocacy centers all over the place, but because this was the mothership and the only one at the time, it, 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 it cr was created in 1985 uh, by a social worker turned politician who saw that children who had um, uh, been abused, particularly sexual abuse, were being dragged to the police station for interviews and to the Department of Children's Services for interviews and over to the courthouse for interviews. And he, he, he thought, we need a place that is safe for children 
to come and tell their story and, and get the help that they need and have their forensic interviews be in one place in a child friendly place. That movement has spawned thousands of other advocacy centers. We have 40 here in Tennessee. Um, so they're, they're by county. Uh, anyway, I got placed there. And so I was working in community mental health and that place found me over in the community mental health center in Huntsville and said, would you begin to, um, would you start to do assessments with our children? And I began to take the complex kiddos that they might have interviewed and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And they sent them to me. I did my neuropsychology assessment with air quotes if you're listening and you can't see. Yeah. <laughs> and the children began to tell me their stories. And I was so young. It was my first experience in the real world of psychology. I'm in community mental health, serving that community. And I didn't even realize that what the children were telling me was as profound as it really was and how it would affect my career. So the children would tell me and I began to understand that what I was seeing in their behavior was not um, was not ADHD or uh, psychosis. Sometimes the, the advocacy center would call and say, we think this child is psychotic, but it was all about the trauma and the attachment disruptions and the neglect that they had sustained in their early brain development. Even then I couldn't have put the words to it, but I began to go then to the multidisciplinary team meetings and I would tell the team at the advocacy center, here's my results. And the child told me all about this history. And they said, the child told you all that? And I'm like, yeah. And they said, well, you just need to keep that child as your client because obviously they trust you. So when about half of my caseload were those children, um, that's when I got the call from the advocacy center saying, would you just come join our staff? And that's when I was driving home one day on a beautiful fall day and the sky was blue and I heard God say, yes, this is what you're to do with this is your this is your path. And I'm like, ah, no, God, this isn't what I signed up for. I signed up for helping kids in school with, you know, learning problems. <laughs> and God said, oh, ho, ho, I have other plans for you. And I and I it was it was a very, very profound call moment and I never have looked back um, from from there. I was there five years and then we moved back to the Nashville, Tennessee area. I became a professor at Vanderbilt University, which was a 17 year uh, position. And in that time, I was able to help uh, form and um, really direct. I was the director of, of a wonderful clinic called the Center of Excellence for Children in State Custody. I was also a professor in the clinical psych department. But this clinic, this very special place, uh, it began to form me even further because the children that came there were children referred by the Department of Children's Services, which is our child welfare um, entity here in Nashville, in Tennessee. The children that were perplexing, the children that would go to the, the, the typical mental health provider um, offerings here, but weren't being figured out. So we, we were the clinic that, that, was, that was there for that purpose, do really in-depth evaluations and figure out what's going on with the children. Um, they had perplexing symptomatology that caregivers were having trouble with. They might have gone through five or six foster homes before we saw them. Regressive behaviors, aggressive behaviors, um, behaviors that sometimes were, were thought to be bipolar because of the mood swings. And through those children and, and working with them and their caregivers and their systems and their schools, 
we were able to begin to understand that these children that we usually found in our clinic to be referred were those that had the most profound early um, brain adaptation to early neglect, uh, violence maybe in the home, chaos, inconsistent caregiving, attachment disruption. And I began to see a pattern in these children. And I began to think, there's something that I need to understand about what all of these children have in common. And I began diving into the research that we had out there, the literature. And what I learned is people hadn't done much writing about this phenomenon at that time. Um, but I began to discover that there was a commonality around what happened in the attachment process. And that led me to discover something called dissociation, which I know we'll talk more about. And, and I began to find the people in the country who knew more about that for children. And I, I found a wonderful mentor up in Michigan and I had her come down to Tennessee and, and, and train a bunch of us. I've had her come down twice. Um, so I began, I, again, I, I really want to emphasize that all of what I've learned is really from the children and the families and my attempt to put labels and names to what I was even seeing and to understand the vulnerability. And that led me to understanding the stigmatization that has been happening to those children for years. And could I become a voice to explain it in a way that was less stigmatizing? And that's kind of become my life journey. Um, I've also run, been the clinical director of a foster care company. And again, what I've learned from those children and families and the beautiful, beautiful souls that are out there to accept and receive these children in, th in their home, persons like you and your family who foster and adopt children who come from really, really difficult beginnings. Um, and how much support those families need has also been one of my um, discoveries. And the more we can help the caregivers feel grounded and settled and secure and, um, and, and less reactive to the behaviors, the more the child will also be able to heal and grow in their attachment, but it all goes together and it's complex. It is so complex. And I, I love that we're framing this conversation through the lens of what these children have taught you um, and how they have informed best practices and a better understanding of what's going on in the brain and in neuropsychology. I also know that we're going to talk about some words today that people may not have a context for quite yet, but I think that everyone could identify a child that has been labeled with a behavior problem. And as we, as we consider what these kids are, are showing on the outside of their bodies, maybe we have not really understood what's going on on the, on the inside of their bodies. So I'm excited to have this conversation today before we dive all the way there. Let's, let's frame this, uh, this conversation again with some language that will help us all be on the same page because, you know, five years ago, two years ago, goodness. I mean, three months ago, there were some of these words that I didn't have language for specifically around developmental trauma. That was something mm -hmm. that I learned from you, something that I learned from others in your field. So let's, uh, let's open up the DSM five. Maybe you can, maybe you can start by talking to us about how psychologists and psychiatrists use this, uh, mm -hmm. this book to help, uh, diagnose, but, uh, and then, and then take us into how you understand developmental trauma. Absolutely. So the DSM-5 TR, this is the book. You can see it's really thick. About and three inches is, fat. <laughs> yes. This is a 2022 um, edition of what's called the DSM, which stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, um, for basically for psychiatric diagnoses. This is what psychologists, psychiatrists, 
clinical social workers and anybody else who does diagnoses, this is the book that we use in the United States. It is edited and produced by the American Psychiatric Association. And it is a, an interesting combination of um, empirical research and political forces. So it is important to know that there are committees that come together and make decisions about what goes into the DSM and what doesn't. And it is, it, so there's a cultural context to it. I also want to point out that there is a worldwide manual called the ICD, uh, which is the International Classification of Diagnoses. And the ICD is in the 11th version, so it's the ICD-11 right now. And it is uh, published by the World Health Organization, or WHO. And it is physical and mental health diagnoses all in one volume. Whereas the DSM that we use mostly in the United States, is that's just mental health. Mm. So... Um, I have the DSM-5, which is not the TR. This is the 2013 edition. So again, 2013 publication. And then we have the 2022. And there was the DSM-4 before that, the DSM-3 before that, which is the one I was trained on in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and DSM it keeps changing, right? Because, uh, and you've got this text revision from the last decade because we continue to use different language around what we continue to learn. And yes, I know that we'll, we'll hear this multiple times on this season, but the brain is the last frontier, right? So what we don't know about health so much is a mystery around the brain. And as, as we learn new things, we need to update our language around that. And dissociation even is, is mm -hmm. a new language compared to multiple personality disorder, maybe an outdated language. And I realize there's many more layers to that. So I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't mean to give just a high level view, but just an example of how our language shifts around what we understand in the body and the brain. 100%. And so this manual is a reflection of our language changing, of our values changing. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, back in the earlier DSMs, homosexuality was a diagnostic and statistical manual um, diagnosis, that wow. it was considered a mental health diagnosis problem. And now that's no longer in the DSM. So it, that shows you just a very easy reference to how cultural shifting and political shifting uh, can create in the, in the manual as well. That's interesting. So that's the DSM, and we have, and we have lots to say about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, talk to us about developmental trauma and how that might be a specific type of trauma compared to other types of trauma we would use in our language. Yes, th this is a really good example of our DSM issues. So we have in our DSM post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, which was a diagnosis originally from our combat veterans that came back from Vietnam. And we realized at that time that there were uh, many of our veterans who were coming back with having intrusions, flashbacks, um, intrusive thoughts. Sometimes they would go into what we call ab reaction, where they'd be thinking that they were under attack maybe if a, if a car backfired, and then they'd be down on the ground, right, covering. And, um, and, and that was um, something that was causing a lot of problems for our veterans. Avoidance is another symptom of PTSD. So it's like, I'm gonna avoid any reminder of, of my trauma, in their case, combat. And so they might shut themselves up. They might, they might numb their feelings. They might um, not be uh, in contact with the world as much. So avoidance was another one of, of PTSD. And then this kind of hyper arousal, always being on alert. Um, you know, am I safe? Am I safe? Checking kind of hypervigilance. So we had PTSD. It was an adult diagnosis. And in the 
um, DSM-5 TR, we now have a PTSD for children, children ages six and younger. And it still looks kind of like an adult diagnosis, but they've included that you might see reenactments, uh, kind of like flashbacks in their play. And their, their intrusive nightmares might be more general rather than actually dreaming of the trauma that they've had. So, so that's a change in PTSD. Now, at the same time that the um, DSM-5 before the TR, this 2013 one, in, in, in 2005, a man named Bessel van der Kolk, another Dutch person, um, he wrote an article called Developmental Trauma Disorder and, 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 die, and gave all of the um, ideas about how we need a new diagnosis in the DSM for children. And it needs to show that in early brain development, that the brain actually adapts differently to the environment that it's in because the brain is going to adapt for survival. Um, I'll tell you more about developmental trauma and what's in it in a moment, but I'll finish with this political part. So Bessel van der Kolk put this whole thing forward. It made total sense to me. I was at Vanderbilt at the time. It was the, he wrote the article in 2005. Um, I was telling everybody about it. It was making, making sense to me with the kids I was seeing in the clinic. And um, I kind of got on the band uh, to say, let's get this in the DSM. And it didn't make it. It didn't make it into the DSM. Um, they said we need more you know, empirical validation and field trials. So I'm going to fast forward us to 2023. And we have what are called the de um, developmental trauma disorder field trial study and we have amazing validity now for developmental trauma disorder i will be shocked if it doesn't make it into the next dsm revision um, we have now a structured interview that we can give to caregivers and or to children these structured interviews have been released to clinicians for use just in 2023 so wow. that's, yeah, that's how I didn't I'm realize how, okay, well, first of all, it's making me feel a little better that I <laughs> didn't know how to use yeah. this, this terminology, but also, yeah. you know, as I look for programs and I look for resources that are, mm -hmm. that are really based on a developmental trauma language mm -hmm. and understanding, they're so hard to find because as you know, the, the mental health field is so specific to individual diagnoses. And yes. as good as the DSM has been for us to understand things, it's also been limiting in, in maybe pigeonholing individuals into, uh, into individual diagnoses that are more, that have maybe have more to do with brain chemistry than experience and survival techniques. Am I understanding that correctly? You are. And there's another point here. This DSM is really based on adults. Mm. We're not very child centric here. Yeah. Um, there is another manual that's come out. This is called the DC zero to five, fairly new manual um, that is diagnostically based for infants birth to five. Really? Wow. So it, it's, it's a newer, um, it's not a DSM. It is uh, published by the group called zero to three and the zero to three group really understand uh, attachment and the caregiving system. So in this book, we have in the back um, really nice uh, tables that say, hey, what does the caregiving environment look like for the developing child? And we, we are moving into an era of infant mental health that's beginning to become its own thing. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's a very important movement. Um, but the DSM itself is very adult based. So when developmental trauma disorder didn't make it into the book, they kind of gave a nod to it by saying, well, we'll do a PTSD uh, six year and under one for the for the DSM. Mm -hmm. But it's not incorporating what I need to tell you about DTD, uh, developmental trauma disorder. 
DTD has at its root the idea that the early brain development in an infant and toddler uh, is impacted by the caregiving environment fully and totally for its development. A brain cannot develop without what we call the serve and return from the caregiver to the baby back and forth. That's how the brain wires. And what we say is what fires together, wires together, mm. right? So think about, um, you know, that, that this is just an amazing fact, but in the infant brain from birth to 18 months, more than a million neural connections per second are formed more than a million neural connections. So what we're talking about is a baby brain that has all these neurons or nerve cells just kind of floating around. You know, they're just kind of there. <laughs> and they want to find each other and wire up and create synapses and kind of think about a, a neural highway, like pathways. And think about a cornfield and if you're or a wheat field, maybe is better and you're walking the wheat field and the more you walk in the same path, the you make a path through the wheat. It's still up here, but this path you can see. So what fires together wires together. So every time a child cries for their for their 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 need to be met, they're fully dependent on the caregiver. So they're crying, they're distressed, they're crying for food, or I'm cold, or I need to be touched. And then the caregiver comes, the little brain gets, um, gets soothed. Because caregivers co-regulate the baby. You know, that's what we do. So that little brain begins to wire up. What fires together, wires together. It wires I cry, you come, I cry, you come. And each time what we're doing is we're wiring up the part of the brain that is fully right hemisphere. And it is creating an emotion regulation system, neural network circuitry, if you will, that is saying, my brain knows how to feel soothed. My brain knows how to feel soothed. I get distressed. I get soothed. I get distressed. I get soothed. I cry. You come. And it's all through caregiver infant interaction. Right? So we're also then getting an internal working template, which basically is I can, I can trust the other because there's this consistent attunement. Mm -hmm. And the brain lays down actual neural circuitry for relationship. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call attachment. So imagine the baby brain that is living in a world around it of perhaps frank neglect. So I cry and you don't come. What happens? What is the brain to do? What mm -hmm. fires together wires together? We've got all these neurons wanting to find each other. The baby brain doubles in size in the first year of life, doubles in size, doubles. You know, by, by age three, 80% of the volume is already formed. So by, by two months, the foundation is laid for all the senses. The brain foundation is laid for all the senses. So what if you have a child who is in the crib not being attended to, or not even maybe in a crib, is, is laying there not being attended to, the sensory stimulation hasn't been given to them around auditory, the sound of language, or visual, different things being in their visual, or touch, you know, then those senses are going to not wire up foundationally very well. And that child will have sensory integration problems later. Meaning I mean, they're resistant to touch or are overly sensitive to touch because they haven't learned what good touch feels like or regulatory touch feels like. Absolutely. That could be one of the things that you see. You can also, you can also see 
the child not being able to integrate any of the sensory things. So you might have a child who's oversensitive to light or noise or, you know, startles or, or undersensitive, depending on what is going around them. What if the brain is in the midst of chaotic domestic violence in the early formation? Then that brain's going to adapt to that environment, probably by shutting down the auditory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. In order and to it, protect itself, because everything in our bodies is, has some tendency to lean into self-preservation. Exactly. In Haiti, children who grow up in orphanages and child servitude systems are often forgotten once they age out at 18. When released, many youth lack the education, life skills, and emotional maturity to live a functional life of independence. Since 2013, Emmaus House has been standing in the gap for orphaned youth in Haiti. Rooted in Christian family settings, we provide holistic care to help youth 18 and older heal from their pasts, be equipped for today, and find empowerment for tomorrow. This holiday season, we'd love for you to join us. Shop our holiday catalog for gifts that will directly impact the lives of orphan youth in Haiti who are working hard towards a better future. Simply go to EmmausHouseHaiti.org backslash holiday catalog to give your gift today. And to learn more about Emmaus House, check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Emmaus House Haiti. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Think Orphan. Think Orphan is the podcast for orphan excellence. Since 2016, Think Orphan has been facilitating conversations in global child welfare, orphan care, and Christian thought. Hosted by Brandon Stiver and Phil Dark, every other Tuesday they discuss issues of foster care and adoption, child protection, and cross-cultural ministry with leaders from around the world. Subscribe to Think Orphan on Apple, Spotify, or whichever podcast platform you prefer. The brain is going to go into survival. It's going to go into self-preservation. So if you've got an environment of neglect or abuse on the baby's body or the chaos and violence around them, then the brain, the part of the brain that's forming really right hemisphere and in the, in the limbic system where we have our threat center, we call it the amygdala, then what we, what we know through, um, through MRI studies, through brain studies, what we know is that the brain actually forms differently because what fires together wires together. Mm-hmm. And we're going to see several differences in brains of our children who are profoundly um, neglected or abused uh, or in an environment that's totally inconsistent. Um, You know, a caregiver might be a person that's struggling with drug addiction and substance use uh, gets in the way of their consistency of caregiving. So there might be weeks when they're really there and attuned and great, and then weeks when they're not. And even that inconsistency is going to play a role in uh, how the early brain develops and, and the kind of attachment that's formed, whether it's secure and that secure attachment that comes from serve and return, consistency and attunement. Secure attachment gives rise to trust in others. So relationship, um, reciprocity later in life, it gets, it gives rise to feeling like I have a core self that is whole, coherent, worthy. Because if you think about what's happening to a baby when the caregiver comes and says, I'm here. I love you. Oh, buddy, come Mm. on. I hear you crying. Let me bounce you. What's happening is the mirror neurons from the caregiver are interacting with the mirror neurons from the baby. And, oh my goodness, you've got this beautiful receiving of, you know, it's almost think of it almost like soul to soul, and maybe it is soul to soul. We know it's energy to energy. And the baby is becoming, oh, I know who I am because I see it in your eyes. And what I see in your eyes, what's mirrored is worthy and loved and it's over and over again coming from your right hemisphere mom to my right hemisphere the baby it's that delight and that place of being known and that leads to self-efficacy and Mm -hmm. and confidence and just an ability to sit with new and complex information without having to assess whether or not it's a threat or not i mean there's so many layers to this which, you know, really 
leads us into that diagnosis of complex PTSD because the a PTSD brain, as you said, is so linked in our minds to combat veterans and what we saw <laughs> post Vietnam. Um, I, I, just to make the connection, Dr. Uh, Bessel van uh, Vander Kolk, Vander Kolk, uh-huh. yeah, Vander Kolk um, wrote The Body Keeps the Score that a lot of people know about and really changed a lot of language for us and how our bodies are right. holding on to trauma. But um, the it, we hear PTSD and we think war and we mm-hmm. think, you know, the first frame that we heard that in maybe with combat veterans, but now you're framing it for us in light of children and the complexities that make it difficult to attach other diagnoses to a child because they're so layered through, uh, as you talked about that developmental trauma piece. So how, how does that play into your work specifically with dissociation and how might you explain dissociation to people who uh, this is new language for? Right, right. Well, let's, let's back up because I don't think I did a great job explaining the, the the three parts of developmental trauma disorder. Oh, good. Yes. Keep going. I'm learning so much. Yeah. But the, but to have the developmental trauma disorder, which we're hoping will be a diagnosis. And by the way, uh, it, it, the closest that we have to it is complex PTSD, which is a diagnosis now in the ICD 11 manual. Okay. So globally we have accepted it, but in the United States, it's not there yet. It's not there yet, but we do have PTSD with dissociation in the DSM, which is the closest we get to complex trauma. Okay, so back to DTD. Um, For developmental trauma disorder to be there, the child has to have faced both attachment bonding rupture, fairly significant rupture, as well as the the combination with um, some kind of maltreatment to themselves or chaos and violence in the environment or witnessing it even in the community. So you could actually have children who have been in a war situation and 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 then the uh, disruption and attachment. Those two could go together and create DTD more likely, at least in this country, in the US, we're looking more at um, children who might be in the context of uh, parents that are caregivers that have their own impairment and are not able to give the care that is necessary for the good secure attachment. Um, But those two things for developmental trauma need to be uh, involved. Whereas with complex trauma, let's say we're looking at an adult with complex trauma, they may have had a situation where they were taken hostage, let's say, when they Mm -hmm. were not a baby even, uh, maybe a child, maybe a teen, maybe even a young adult. And they were held in hostage situation for a very long time and, and abused and brainwashed and all the things that they had to do to be to survive. Maybe they were in organized abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe they didn't have the infant early stuff. They could still have the complex trauma from, from the later experience, uh, with developmental trauma disorder, we're really talking about, uh, the early brain formation. So it's, yeah, a little different, but, um, but, but in the ICD 11, the complex trauma symptomatology is going to map onto DTD symptomatology fairly well. But in in DTD, uh, we have not only those circumstances of what happened early on, but then we're going to have three categories. One is emotion dysregulation. Mm -hmm. So maybe some mood swings, that kind of thing. um, And and or somatic dysregulation. So that's in the same category, emotion, somatic dysregulation. In DTD, it's always going to be dysregulation. Okay. That's if, if anybody can take one word, it's it's everything's dysregulated. It's just all over the place and kind of unpredictable oftentimes what's going to show up, which is sometimes how we can tell the difference between bipolar disorder and DTD, because bipolar tends to have more episodes of mood swings like mania and depression, whereas DTD, it could 
you can have several shifts in a daytime in one day mm -hmm. that look really different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so emotion and somatic dysregulation. What would somatic dysregulation look like? I had a young person recently who was having episodes of syncope, in other words, kind of fainting and just falling out. Also episodes of not being able to walk. Her legs would become paralyzed. That is somatic dysregulation. Uh, there was no organic cause for it, no medical cause for it. So it turns out that this was um, really a dissociative process for her, which we'll talk about dissociation <laughs> again in a minute. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, dissociation is often a part of developmental trauma disorder um, in this um, emotion dysregulation part or somatic. And the next criterion is attentional and or behavioral dysregulation. So, you know, we have kids who will be able to spell their spelling words just right with their caregiver the night before they go to take their test and they go in to take their test and they have no recollection mm -hmm. and they can't do it. Or they, they've learned something and then they suddenly, it's like they never learned it. Um, what's happened? Uh, they are dissociating and they are losing memory for something that they did learn but is no longer there. That's attentional or behavioral dysregulation. I, I, I worked with a young girl not all that long ago who would um, get down on the floor and act like a dog, hmm. right? That was very strange to her caregivers. Um, it turned out she had a self state inside that was a dog it, it, and we'll talk again that's more of the, on the dissociation, but she actually had like an imaginary friend that had developed to help her survive as a little as a younger child that was a dog and it was a soothing part of, of her imaginary friend network and it became a self state. Um, that when she got triggered through stress in certain ways, she would just become this dog. And it was um, it was very befuddling to her caregivers for this seven year old to suddenly be in this state. That's behavioral dysregulation. And there's lots of, of um, uh, another example I can think of from my early days. <laughs> Um, like the first time that I really like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Um, a foster mom came in and said that, that her daughter, who was at the time nine, that they bought her some new blue jeans at Walmart. The child was so excited to have the new blue jeans. And the next day, the foster mom found the new blue jeans. They'd been cut up with scissors, holes, just damaged. She confronts the nine-year-old and says, why did you do this? And, and this, there's no other person in the house. So, you know, unless the foster mother didn't remember that she did it. <laughs> She's like, why did you do this? And she, and, and the foster mother said to me, Dr. Patty, if I hadn't known that this child was the only one who could have done it, I would have believed she didn't do it because she had no, her, she said, she's the best liar ever. And, and this is when I began to wake up like she's not lying. She simply doesn't remember because the part, the self state that came out in this aggressive way, uh, really to destroy against herself, um, that self state was a dissociated part that did not remember doing it. Mm. So you're saying to her, you did this, and now she's feeling ashamed and and like she's being accused of something she didn't do. And so then it doesn't seem fair. And then imagine what happened between the caregiver and the child. Yes, you did. And, you know, all of that that happens. So that's the second one. So we have attentional and somatic dysregulation. Then we have I mean, we have somatic and emotional dysregulation, then attentional and behavioral dysregulation. And then um, finally, relational and or self relational mm -hmm. so other relational or self relational dysregulation and this self relational uh, dysregulation is where the dissociation really comes in because the self has 
fragmented um, in the what fires together wires together part of early development what we believe now is that the brain adapts by basically saying i can't be here right now in the midst of this neglect which might include starvation right or real hunger or i can't be here right now in the midst of the domestic violence that's going on around them and the chaos or i can't be here right now if their little body is being harmed and so the brain adapts its wiring to protect the child from knowing to protect the child from being there at the time of this horrendous problem because a child's go-to is their caregiver and if they're in dire straits like really hungry and their caregiver isn't available their go-to isn't there but they can't lose their caregiver because they would die so the baby brain adapts in what we call survival terror mode this is survival terror i'm gonna die but if i if i you know go against my parent i'm really gonna die so i'm just gonna go away and wire up a another part that kind of is locked behind a door that I won't have to know about. I don't have memory for it. That's dissociation. And in babies and children, those self states can simply be uh, emotion blobs, if you will, right? So rage, the infant rage of not being cared for or shame of feeling like there's something wrong with me because I had a need or um, you know, um, despair is, is one that could be in there, which could be really touched off and, and then look later like depression um, or hopelessness or folding down. Um, so it can be just self states that are more like emotion states that are, but again, they're kind of locked away. And the only time that they get expressed is when there's something in the later environment that reminds the child or the young adult, you know, because dissociation gets wired, it's going to be there forever until it's not through some good therapy. Um, if it gets reminded, that's when that self state might come out. And at its greatest extreme of dissociation, we might have actual alter self states that have different personalities. And that's where you were going to with multiple personality disorder, which we now call dissociative identity disorder. That's the extreme of dissociation. At the bottom level of dissociation, we actually have non pathological dissociation, which is what you and I do when we're driving down the highway and suddenly go, wait a minute, I've been going for 50 miles and I didn't see the exit because my mind's been up here, but my body's been doing this. <laughs> right, right. Oh. So we naturally dissociate. That there's so many, there are so many implications here for parents, yeah. for those who are caring for vulnerable children. I'm thinking about teachers in the classroom mm -hmm. and how, you know, the layers, again, I'm going to use that word and, and, and hope, uh, you know, hope that we can all kind of look at the children that we are around. I'm sure that some, there are some images that people have of, of kids or of, or of adults that they've witnessed that they just weren't able to put their finger on the behavior that they were witnessing. We often see the behavior, like I said earlier on the outside, and then we try to fit it into a box of something that we <laughs> already understand. I mean, that's normal about how the brain works too. And that's, that's educational psychology. I, I'm thinking about the kids who used to be in my classroom and you know, I would witness their behaviors and think, okay, well, what box do I put this behavior mm -hmm. in so mm -hmm. that I know how to teach them X, Y, Z and for kids with these complex traumas or, or developmental traumas mm -hmm. fit into a typical IEP an individualized education plan, because this is not a learning disability. This is not a, even a behavioral, you know, issue. It's really, it's really much more than that. And we're just scratching the surface on yes. the needs of these kids. 
Yes. And I like that you said trying to fit it into a box. So I had a, a young uh, girl, she was 10 years old when I was with the foster care company and I would get consults on some of the more complex kiddos. This child was about to be um, moved from her second foster home because she was creating a lot of difficulties around a 10 year old girl, but she was defecating outside of the toilet and smearing her feces, things that were that primitive. Mm -hmm. she, was, she could come be become very, very oppositional. And at the same time, she could care for her baby sibling like like nobody else is allowed to care for them and she could be very nurturing. But she could turn around and be, you know, duking it out and hurting another sibling. So she was a she was a child with a lot of issues going on and the, the Enco Priestess pooping outside of the toilet. The Enco Priestess was a very difficult problem for that for the, for this family. You know, the doctors at the children's hospital said there's nothing medically wrong let's send her to a residential treatment up in another state where they deal with the behavioral issues of encopresis that's what she needs and anyhow before that happened the child was sent to me for a consult and it turned out that we the foster care company had not known and, and the department of children's services really didn't know what had happened to her early and once we learned more about her history which is of course my job I, I began to hypothesize that maybe there was dissociation or developmental trauma and dissociation. And it turned out, yes, the encopresis was actually a, a two-year-old self-state. And when she had the accidents, it was a part of her that wasn't toilet trained. So again, look what we're doing to the child. We're putting her in this box and then we're shaming her. Like, you should know better, you're 10 years old. 10 year olds don't poop outside the toilet. And yet she, she didn't have memory for it, but she was too ashamed. So she pretended like when her foster mom would say, why did you, why did you poop in your pants? She would try to figure out why, what, maybe why she would I have. So she's like, I, I just got so into playing outside mom, but she didn't really even remember. And when her mom brings it to her attention, she now smells it. She knows it's in her pants. This, when we think about the perplexing behaviors for the parent, it's so hard on them, but then we turn it back around to what is it like for the child? If it's perplexing for us and they've got amnesia for the stuff they're doing, I mean, what are, what are the internal messages they're gonna start telling themselves? You know, I'm really sick, I'm really messed up, I'm, I'm bad. Um, and, and we're not, as adults and teachers and caregivers, we're not meaning to put any more on them, but one of the things we're doing is we're using this. What box can we put them in? It's a medical model. If, it's, if, it, if we can name it, maybe we can treat it. And, and we sometimes rush to diagnosis and label, and we might label the child. This child that I'm talking about, she had a label of oppositional defiant disorder which is a label that I believe is very harmful. I do not believe it should be in the DSM. I think it's basically saying you're a bad kid. And, and if people, and if teachers see that, are they going to have empathy? No, no because are, we're making it about a child's character rather yes. than their experiences. And, yes. and that really leads us into, you know, what I'm so thrilled to share with people about, about your work, because Children are dependent on adults for everything around them. Everything. And they are dependent on us to uh, explain what is going on in an environment. They're also dependent on us to create boundaries and safety for them. Right. And when the adults who are working with children who have experienced these things are, again, labeling their behaviors out of associated with their character rather mm -hmm. than their experiences that those children will internalize that and create a new identity for themselves that that just mirrors what language adults have given them around these diagnoses or around the you know the words that they use around discipline or you know things that I, I mean and I have made this mistake with my own children over and over again so please don't hear me casting shame to listeners but to just say 
what is our responsibility to children Mm -hmm. when it comes to our own curiosity and allowing children to guide our understanding about what's going on in their bodies and with them, rather than using Mm -hmm. data that we've pulled from adults who finally have language for what's (laughs) going on. You know, I, 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 I'd love to hear you kind of share what, what goes through your mind when you see a kid with with a high number of adverse child experiences, we call them ACEs. And and there's loads of data around numbers of ACE scores and, and how that relates to comorbidities or kids that will, you know, have a higher likelihood of, of drug addiction or heart problems or things as they, as they age. But when you see a child who has had those adverse child experiences and you see the diagnoses that have been placed on them, how do you conceptualize difficult children? What goes through your mind and, and how do you yeah. think through those kids' presentation? Yeah, I ask myself what happened to them and that's very important. And when did it happen to them? So Dr. Bruce Perry has done a lot of research on neurosequential modeling and, and his whole theory is that at very different developmental times of brain development, what happens to you, traumatically speaking, is going to show up differently in your behavior. Um, so one of the things we can, so what I do is I think like Bruce Perry, I, I, I want to know what happened and when. Particularly, I want to know what happened from birth to age three. Mm. And and in the clinic at the Center of Excellence for Children in State Custody, I would ask the caseworkers from DCS, can you get me anything on the child's history, you know, from birth to age three? And they're like, why? They don't, they won't remember anything from that time. I'm like, oh, it makes all the difference because that's Mm. when all the foundation is laid. And, and, and so I want to know that. And then I want to know also what were the protective factors, which is very important because a child, let's say, in the in in a context of domestic violence, and maybe um, a, a, a caregiver who struggles with substance use disorder. Let's say we have that scenario, but we have a grandmother who lives in the house with them, or lives next door, and the grandmother becomes a buffering, protective figure in the life of that child. Well, that child may have the same what happened to to use as another child, but a very different protective factor. So if a child has somewhere safe to go and and that it could be an older sibling in the family, Um, if there's some kind of safety or even uh, periods of safety in between events, uh, all of these things matter in conceptualizing the child. Also, we're all born differently. Some of us are born like dandelions, you know, put us anywhere. We're going to grow through the concrete. We're very robust, simply in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Some of us are born like orchids. We're more delicate, more sensitive, more, usually more anxious in, in our, in our makeup. We have good research showing familial or genetic lines for anxiety. That the, the, the anxiety runs on the DNA of a family. Okay, so we have that. We know that. So I want to also know kind of what's the natural makeup of the temperament of the child. Are they a dandelion? Are they an orchid? Um, so I'm using some of that. We also know that historically there, there are um, traumas that carry on the DNA. We know that historical trauma for African Americans uh, raises up their uh, potential for heart disease. Uh, hypertension is much higher for African Americans, and it's been traced to the historical trauma of us going and taking persons from their home and enslaving them, and all the things that we've done as in this country. Um, so we know that people who survived the Holocaust. Um, that the that on their DNA they carry much higher potential for PTSD. We know that in our indigenous people that we remove from their homes and put on the trail of tears and put them in reservations and all the things that happen there. We know that their DNA carries higher levels of diabetes, alcoholism. 
So when I conceptualize, I'm trying to think through all of these factors. And then what is the context of the child right now? What are the, what's the caregiving system now? What's the school system now? Does it match? Is there empathy? Do people understand? Are we listening to the child's uh, uh, body behavior and spoken? Um, are we watching and being attuned? Um, what, what are our expectations? Do we need to bring those down in order for a child to be more successful? Do we need to bring our own expectations to a reasonable level and then scaffold them as we help them progress in development rather than thinking they're like every other kid their age? Because developmentally, they may really not be. They may be uneven. Mm -hmm. Some of our kids with DTD have really uh, um, undeveloped emotional control regulation because that didn't wire up well, but they actually may have some of them a pseudo maturity in how they think because maybe they were a kid who took care of younger siblings and grew up in ways that was faster than other children. You know, so we have to look at every child and who they are and be careful about labeling, be careful about the medical model and diagnosis because we're really way more complex than that. Um, the DSM doesn't take into account spiritual kinds of parts of us as humans. I look at that part too. What's the, sometimes you see kids and you're like, this child has so much spiritual stuff. You can feel it. You can feel that spiritual energy. Are we noticing that? What, how does that feed into their whole being? That's not in the DSM. It's more holistic. And our systems in the United States are very reactionary mm -hmm. uh, to, to capturing someone in a moment mm -hmm. rather than looking at the whole person. Um, anytime that, that I talk about law enforcement or I talk about the justice system, I get a lot of pushback. And I want to, before I ask the next question, just be clear that I am so grateful for the work that our men and women on the front lines do every day, the trauma that they put themselves in front of in order to protect those of us who are civilians. I also um, feel that they are grossly underfunded in their own mental health services and the support that they have and the understanding that they have from people like you who have looked at children and, and trauma in a way that would really better inform best practices around policing. So I want to I want to say that first. I, I feel grateful that in Murray County, where I live in Tennessee, we have some of the best city police that I have ever, ever encountered in the United States that were the first ones, I believe, in the state of Tennessee to have body cams. And, and they are very, very um, trained in trauma responses. Um, brilliant men and women. Other times I see examples of tragic policing with a lot of misunderstanding around the individuals that, that someone is interacting with from a law enforcement standpoint. And, you know, whether that's the case of George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery, whether that's the case of 16 year old, 15, 16 year old girls who are pinned down um, at a birthday party. Um, sometimes when I'm watching videos that I don't go looking for, but that find me, on social media mm -hmm. after a, a massive outcry. It's so obvious to me, it's so obvious to me that the people who are commenting on a certain um, a certain engagement with law enforcement have never witnessed a child in dysregulation before. Mm -hmm. And how uh, children who have this developmental trauma that you're talking about and dissociative tendency, they are not capable in a moment of linear thought and action that would make sense to someone who was not in a dysregulated state. Right. So we see this policing, um, again, just really reactionary and you do so much work um, flying all over the country, mm -hmm. meeting individuals who have been sentenced to death because mm -hmm. of something that they did in one moment of their life. Right. I'm curious if you could share what that experience has been like interviewing those, those individuals and how that has formed maybe your, your particular uh, 
thoughts and hopes for how we might see the U.S. justice system um, embrace what you've learned? Yes. So I gave a, a keynote talk at the Tennessee Voices for Children Symposium back in, I want to say maybe 2007, about some of the things we've been talking about today. And I was picked up by a defense attorney who said, you can help me with my clients that are adults because they have the same kind of backgrounds, childhood backgrounds that you're talking about. And I think you could be helpful in telling their story. So that's how I went from child and adolescent clinical psychologist to death row. Um, I have sat now with so many, um, both men and women now, um, it was all men for a while, but I've had two women in the last couple years. Um, and some of them are not on death row. Some of them are in a pre-sentence now for capital crimes that could put them on death row. But my job is to, is, to, is to do the same thing I do with children, which is to figure out what happened to them and put it in a context that we can understand and, and help the jury or the clemency board or sometimes the governor um, understand as well so that we may uh, perhaps have a different kind of sentence for them and, and for those on death row already. It's either going to be life in prison or it's going to be on to execution. But we are beginning to find that um, helping people understand what happened to these persons, we are finding that some of the sentencing has been reversed in the, in the cases that I've worked on, or they're not given death in the first place. They're just, give, just given life in prison. Um, but what I found is the persons I've talked with who've been on uh, death row for a while are many of them, they're converted into uh, persons of deep faith and they are actually doing ministries and they're partnered with churches and they're doing ministries with people. It's fabulous. And I sit with these persons and I learn their story and I read records from their past and I talk to some of their family members. Sometimes talk to, I talk to one of their first grade teachers um, and, or social workers. I learn their life and then I work with them to understand their life. And they, 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 they often will cry and they will say, you mean it wasn't all my fault? Mm -hmm. And their shame begins to shed. And they say, thank you. And they're so grateful. Thank you for helping me understand what happened to me and how I got here. And it's, it's actually, um, it's changed me as a human being to sit with these persons that are in a circumstance that I would think is the worst of all circumstances and to see their gratitude and to see their willingness to uh, crochet care bears with a little cross in the heart and for a ministry with a church or make these little cross necklaces out of garbage bags that the guards will bring them. And they tear strips of the plastic and they put them together like we would do from a craft store with those lanyard kind of things, but they've figured it out. Um, or writing letters to people in despair. So many interesting changes. And so what, what we need to help people understand is, let's back it up, first of all, because no one that I've visited, that I've been called to, to visit, no one had the help that they needed when they were children. Mm -hmm. Um, the systems did not support them, the, the child welfare system, the education system, the mental health system, that's my system. They weren't supported. And mm -hmm. so that's part of my, that's part of what I point out. I'm like, what if, what if we could go back and support even their caregivers when they had them at birth? Yeah, exactly. Right. So what I've learned is that we're not we, we are labeling bad rather than having a lens of a trauma lens of what happened to you. And if we could go back way into childhood, that would be best. But let's even start with juvenile justice system. We still have a chance if we can look at our juvenile justice system and say, can we do really thorough trauma? screenings 
can we figure out what happened to them and now help to repair, heal, open up their world to the possibilities that they might not even know because of what's happened to them and the internal messages that they are carrying. Um, the crimes that are committed from the people that I've talked with are often committed in a dissociated state. Mm -hmm. And and even for those who, who weren't in a dissociated state, they were in a dysregulated state right. um, from their trauma reminders. And, and because they didn't get help along the way, they're often looking for ways to quell all that dysregulation. And that looks like substance use. Mm -hmm. How are you going to make your brain calm down and your body be less hypervigilant and all the things? Well, boy, who Xanax really works well, mm -hmm. or Oxycontin helps me, or alcohol takes the edge off. And then those very vulnerable brains link on to those substances. And now we've got all the secondary problems that substances bring. And then the tertiary problems that health you know, internal body systems yes. um, from that. And, yes. you know, I, I, you've been so generous with your time. And I know that we're both sitting in Tennessee right now, and I don't mean to make this political, yeah. especially because these are things that I didn't, these are things that I didn't know years mm -hmm. ago. These are things that I'm still learning and, and still very curious about. But from a policy standpoint, last year, our, our law, um, our lawmakers in Tennessee put kind of a hard stop on third graders and said, if you haven't learned to read by third grader, you haven't passed your state standardized testing at third grade, you're not allowed to move forward. Um, and I'm looking at everything you're saying today and I'm like, man, if you don't have what you need at six months old, yes. how are you yes. going to learn to read? Because yes. the way that your brain is impacted as an infant. So shouldn't we be dumping our resources into those zero to three year things that families need, right? Yes. Um, so that kids have the opportunity for success. A few weeks ago, our governor broke ground on a $415 million interagency law enforcement training facility in Tennessee. Like if we had, and I just have said, like, you're going to have to police all the children that you didn't arm with resources as infants. And imagine what would happen if we dumped $415 million into the hands of families who can't afford childcare, who can't access, um, you know, developmentally appropriate uh, schools. We're talking about denying $2 billion in federal education funding in Tennessee. And I, all of this is coming to me through this lens of what you're talking about. And I'm just saying we can do so much better. hundred percent. So in Tennessee, we did start the Building Strong Brains Tennessee initiative, which has had some funding around giving grant money to various agencies to do exactly what you're talking about to really begin to invest in the early brain development so that's a good thing but yes if 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 i could wave my magic wand we would put so much of our federal and state resources into the early and, and the problem is it's not gonna we're not gonna see it pay off till later but the return on investment has been looked at there is some research of, of the return on investment for investing in the young ones in the young brain and it's profound it's really good stuff but it is politicians are going to be uh you know they're going to be looking at their term right right and and the real results of this is going to be beyond their term right so how do they even tell the story of building something that they can't prove within the within the context of their term that makes a lot of sense yeah you got it so i think that's part of the problem but i do believe that we as a people uh people a national people we should be jumping up and down and stamping our feet for resourcing early brain development because if we can lay the good foundation mm -hmm. even if stuff happens really traumatically later those persons are really able to be helped through our typical therapies because the foundation is there and they have that trust language and they have that coherent self-core language 
And so traditional mental health, what we already have in place works pretty well if somebody has a good attachment foundation and a good early brain foundation. It's way harder if you don't have that foundation. And this is where we may be needing to think about different kinds of options for treatment that are kind of a below the verbal kind of treatments. Um, one thing we've learned about people with high dissociation is that those we believe that those people have a high a high trait that they're born with for hypnotizability. Mm -hmm. um, so people that actually like you might have two people that have the same kind of experiences early on and the ones that go into more high dissociation they also had that trait of, of hypnotizability, whereas these people might be pretty dysregulated, but they don't have the dissociation. Same experience, but the trait. So a lot of people now are for adult dissociation are using hypnosis as a treatment. All right, and we see that in the anti-trafficking field as well, because it's the least invasive therapy treatment that we can find because you know, we're not hooking anyone up to any neurofeedback, you know, cords or anything. And you don't have to relive those memories while you are in a hypnotic state. And so it's a really safe place for people to work through traumas in, like you said, in that, in that moment of dissociation, right. this is, there's so many things to unpack. So there. many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. I, so, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to, yeah. How would you, how would you say, wrap this conversation up? Yeah, just so back to resources. Um, I think that we, there's a couple things. If I could again, wave my magic wand, educate people on the very things we've been talking about, the importance of early brain development, put more resources into infant mental health in general. That's an NIH, an NIMH kind of um, advocacy, right? If we could help our funders of research put more into early brain development, that's a place to start that we might have some advocacy potential, right? And then I, I really believe that we can look at some models like safe baby court models. There's something called safe baby court that you've got teams of people who understand young children and their caregivers. And the team in the court is making is helping to make collaborative decisions around um, the best interest of the child in their attachment process and their early development, which is including the natural family, the birth family typically, and the, the that natural birth fam natural or birth family, because it could be an adoptive family, whoever is go involved with this child, um, that natural family is part of the decision making and part of the recipient of getting um, the, the resources and the treatment necessary. So let's say you have a, a birth mom who really wants to get better in her own mental health situation. She's in there in court with the whole team saying, I can commit to these treatments, I can do this. And the child is still being able to visit very, 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 very regularly. So we're not breaking their attachment by putting them in foster care, but they're in foster care but they're also with birth mom routinely um, and, and frequently is really what I'm saying here. Those kind of models are also something we need to be looking at by being informed by the um, infant development, early attachment lens. Yeah, that's huge. So, you know, we won't have, we won't have resources funded unless we have really good research to back it up, but we can't do the research to back it up unless we have funding to do the research. And at the end of the day, if we were all just people who, who with our words, with the way that we live our life, with the way that we advocate for our neighbors, with the way that we vote, with the way that we engage with the world around us, remain mm -hmm. curious and say, this doesn't quite add up. What am I not understanding about this person so that I can, I can express my empathy in a way that keeps them safer and, and allows them to be more whole. Um, mm -hmm. So much more work to be done, but Dr. Patty, you have helped tremendously today. Piece some things together in my own mind. I know for the people who are listening, maybe just uh, so many brain tingles, we say, but uh, <laughs> things that are, are making sense finally, and those synapses are connecting in our own brains to just say, oh, that's 
that's what I didn't understand about this. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the ways that you uh, lay your own time and energy down um, at the feet of the most marginalized. I'm really grateful for you. Thank you. I, I, it's my pleasure being here. We could go on all day. I'm seeing. So I think, yeah, I think we need a whole, a whole season just around this. It's fascinating. <laughs> Well, best to you and your endeavors. And thank you for having me as a guest. And um, I'll, I'll see you in an, another context, I'm sure. Thank you so much for listening in. And we are always eager to hear from you as you process these nuanced topics. Shoot me an email at lauren at kindredexchange.co or find me on Instagram at upwardly dependent. Of course, I always welcome your honest reviews on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast, or you can engage with us on our Kindred Exchange Instagram at kindred.exchange. Just do me one favor. As we process and grow together, stay rooted in truth that you know is absolute. And that is the fact that we are finite beings and therefore rely on something much bigger than ourselves. That's what the upwardly dependent life is all about.